Hello and welcome to tonight's book reading session of Preparing for the Day After, a picture e-book. Preparing for the Day After is a photojournalistic treatise on disaster mitigation published by me, Malini Shankar and Walter Keller for the 10th anniversary of the Asian Tsunami. Tonight we will learn more about early warning and forecasting calamities in the second part of chapter 19. But let us first recap what we have learned in the previous book reading sessions before we start tonight's session. Water and sanitation is central to developing developmental discourse. Culture sensitive food security also has evolved out of local agrometeorological conditions prevalent in the area. Livelihoods based on local agrometeorological conditions are the best means of ensuring livelihood security. Climate change adaptation, menstrual hygiene, especially for indigenous tribal women, solid waste management, universal healthcare access, sustainable development goals, they are all factors to be included in the development agenda. Media personnel have to be trained in reporting disaster preparedness or the lack of it at district level. Disaster is the impact of a calamity on the human landscape. This includes the impact on lives, livelihoods, livestock and landscape. Tonight we will start with the chapter, two, uh, chapter 19 part 2 on early warning and forecasting calamity. Continuing from where I left off last week while reading the tsunami warning bulletin issued by Indian National Science. Indian National Center for Ocean Information Services <clears throat> after the 11th of April 2012 trike slip earthquake in the northeast of the Indian Ocean. Data from sea level gauges confirmed that a tsunami had been generated. The expected period of significant tsunami waves is now over for all the threatened Indian coastal areas based on the ITEWC invoice modeling, it said. Because local conditions can cause a wide variation in tsunami wave action, cancellation of national warnings and all clear determination must be made by the national, state or local authorities, as the case may be. Please be aware that dangerous currents can continue for several hours after the main tsunami waves have passed. The advice, this bulletin is being issued as advice. Only national, state and local authorities and disaster management officers have the authority to make decisions regarding the official threat and warning status in their coastal areas and any action to be taken in response. Update, no further bulletins will be issued by ITEWC of INCOIS for this event unless other inf information becomes, becomes available. Contact information, Indian Tsunami Early Warning Center of the Indian National Center for Ocean Information Services, address Ocean Valley, Pragati Nagar, uh, Nizam Pet, Hyderabad, 5600090, India. Telephone 040-91040-2389-5011 and Fax is 9140238950012. Email is tsunami at incoist.gov.in and the website is uh, www.incoist.gov.in. The ITEWC of INCOIS, which specializes in quantitative forecasts, accurately forecasts the estimated height of a potential tsunami at less than one meter tsunami on the 11th of April 2012, predicted the course and time of the arrival of tsunami at only three islands, that is Kamorta, Kachal and Great Nicobar in Indian territory, avoiding create creation of panic and unnecessary evacuation in other islands. But islanders were nervously biting their lips till the tsunami warning was lifted. Some islanders ran pell-mell across the crocodile-infested creeks in Great Nicobar Islands and Little Nicobar Island. However, most islanders that I spoke to confirmed that, that precautionary evacuation undertaken by the island administration in Kamorta, Kachal and Great Nicobar Island was effective. In Coises, Tsunami Early Warning Center called ITEWC has specialized in drawing quantitative tsunami forecasts. Chief Tsunami Forecaster or Chief Oceanographer at the ITEWC in INCOIS, Dr. T. Srinivas Kumar spoke exclusively to me uh, and he said, Tsunamis can be generated by undersea earthquakes, sea mounts or submarine volcanic explosions, undersea nuclear explosion or submarine landslides. The undersea earthquake should have a minimum magnitude of 6.5 for a generation of a tsunami to be triggered. 
we have assessed most seismically active zones around the Indian Ocean rim and have identified two zones called the Andaman Sumatra zone in the Bay of Bengal and the Makran zone in Arabian Sea that can generate tsunami genic earthquakes. According to a release made available to me by INCOIS, the standard operating procedure include components of the early warning system are land-based seismic network, sea level observational network of tide gauges and tsunami voice, tsunami modeling, standard operating procedure and the decision support system for generation of the advisories and communication network for timely dissemination of the advisory. There is a particular Wikipedia link which is going to come up here. Based on this assessment, we can give quantitative tsunami forecast and early warning like the estimated height of the tsunami, the coasts it will affect and the time of arrival of the tsunami. Based on this, the government, Bethune's Weiser, the administration issues warnings alerts and watch in conformance to stipulated or standard operating procedure in different countries, regions and territories of the Indian Ocean Rim, Dr. Srinivas Kumar explained. Further, the difference between qualitative tsunami alert that many other tsunami warning centers issue and the quantitative tsunami warning issued by INCOIS lies in the quantifiable assessment. We issue height of the tsunami in centimeters or meters, the coast it can hit and the time of arrival all based on real time data whereas the qualitative alert issued currently by other warning centers is relative and generic forecasting more like the entire ocean rim or a radius of 1000 kilometers from the epicenter etc that leaves all the countries on high alert whereas a quantitative assessment like we do at incois makes specific forecasts of tsunami height at specific coast that is why for the April 11, 2012 strike slip earthquake, we were able to issue specific warnings of wave heights and time of arrival of the tsunami to three specific islands in the Nicobar. No an unnecessary panic was created. The difference between qualitative and quantitative tsunami forecasting lies in the specifics location, estimated heights and the estimated time. It helps in disaster risk reduction and effective disaster mitigation, says Dr. Srinivas Kumar, unquote. The warning time that is available to us is the travel time of the tsunami wave from the place of origin of the tsunami to a particular coast. It can be from 15 minutes if it is from a submarine earthquake to trigger a tsunami near Andaman or Nicobar Islands to a maximum of three hours to mainland from say somewhere near the coast of Sumatra. Forecasting tsunamis called so thorough bathymetric data, depending on how thorough the database is, that much more accurate the forecast will be. Bathymetric data includes factors that can accelerate the tsunami waves and contours of the ocean floor that can shape the direction of the tsunami waves. So accurate bathymetric profile is one of the primary factors of tsunami forecasting. Ocean state forecast for fisher folk welfare and disaster resilience. INCOIS also offers information dissemination on marine weather forecast which is of immense value to fisher folk and shipping industry given the fact that the Indian Meteorological Department issues only terrestrial weather forecasts. INCOIS is also involved in other activities such as providing advisory services by translating ocean science to societies such as identifying potential fish fishing zone around the Indian Sea based on satellite derived sea surface temperature and chlorophyll. INCOIS also provides marine weather forecasting and using state of the ocean model. Other science activities such as understanding the dynamics and thermodynamics of the Indian Ocean both on short and long term basis by deploying many in situ ocean observing systems such as tide gauges, moored buoys, agro profiling floats, current meters near the coast and in the equator, wave rider buoys. Uh, automatic weather stations on board such re research vessels, etc., are undertaken by INCOIS. These instruments provide valuable information about the ocean and help to understand cyclone genesis, intensity and track, Indian Ocean dipole, El Nino and La Nina, monsoons, etc., says Dr. M. Ravi Chandra in an exclusive discussion with me held in INCOIS Hyderabad. INCOIS also offers other information services such as advisory services to fishing communities, marine weather forecasts to shipping in industry and fisher folk communities. These advisories are picked up by the community radio broadcasters like Radio Alakal, Radio Konark or MSSRF's community radio stations and the advisories are interpreted in terms of ocean state forecasts, potential fishing zones, course of currents, wind speeds, etc. These inputs are then broadcast by the respective community radio stations to their audience in the local language. Though the fisher folk are Im imbibed by traditional wisdom to read and interpret ocean state forecasts, these scientific advisories 
subsidies help them reduce disaster risk and optimize fish catch sustainably without having to invest expensive fishing gear etc for more on this topic please visit ips newsnet uh, i am sharing this link with you right here an article that i have published in the interpress news service our ability to make a timely forecast depends on how soon we detect an earth seismographs from all around the world feed real time data snow and avalanche study establishment of the defense research and development organization in chandigarh in india is responsible for avalanche forecasting in india's himalayan states of himachal pradesh jammu and kashmir and uttarakhand Sase, as it's called, that is the Snow and Avalanche Study Establishment. Sase issues avalanche forecasts as also forecasts of snowfall based on precipitation. Sase has mapped avalanche-prone areas and once forecasts and once forecasts accurately the path and intensity of an avalanche in Gulmarg in Jammu and Kashmir on the 7th of February 2010. based on the forecast all tourists were evacuated to safety but 17 army personnel training in avalanche conditions were unfortunately buried alive as they did not evacuate in time it was another instance of soldiers dying for the cause of civilian safety there is a link for this i'm putting it up in the both the description box below and i'll try to put it up in the video here as well there are two basic methods of anticipating an avalanche hazard one is the examination of the snow cover structure for patterns of weakness particularly those leading to slab avalanches the second method is the analysis of the meteorological factors affecting snow deposition in particular the two methods overlap and both are used emphasis on either one or the other depends on the local climate pattern of snowfall snow type and avalanche characteristics both apply principally to winter avalanches in dry snow conditions forecasting wet spring avalanches depends on knowledge of the heat input to the snow surface according to the ndma guidelines for snow and avalanche and landslide preparedness guidelines the link of which is going to be put up here as well as in the description box below similarly on the 7th of october 2013 india's meteorological department issued a cyclone warning forecasting accurately the path and intensity of an imminent cyclone heading towards the coast of orissa it was prescribed by american weather forecasting agencies as of the same intensity as that of the orissa super cyclone of october 1999 basing their calculations on wind speeds director general of india's meteorological department dr lakshman singh rathor struck, struck to a imd's estimate of the cyclone named phylin being just short of a super cyclone in an array of television discussion with 5 days of window period for effective coordination india's national disaster management authority smarting under the criticism of not delivering effectively in the uttarakhand flash flood disaster of june 2013 Uh, acted proactively working on prescribed directions in conformance to standard operating procedures ndma got credit for minimizing loss of life when cyclone phylin made landfall on the evening of the 11th of october 2013 in orissa's puri district on a put this link you may find an article by the author that is me in the interpress news service about how ndma coordinated effectively to minimize loss of lives NDMA team work manifested in National Disaster Response Force search and rescue teams being alert and on standby the people in the districts in the path of the cyclone were evacuated by the district administration people in coastal areas and low lying areas were evacuated to cyclone shelters food medicines and warm clothing were arranged power supply companies switched off power supply as the cyclone neared landmass Naval divers and navy personnel ushered fisher folk out at sea to safety on dry land. And bringing sense to it all was a very competent public relations officer of India's National Disaster Management Authority, Ms. Tripti Parule and her team dishing out press releases by the hour as the time of landfall neared. It proved that effective early warning rights on effective mass communication the public relations team of the ndma ensured that public service announcements for evacuation were broadcast regularly on local language broadcasts on all india radio and doordarshan in the days and hours before the cyclone made landfall now let's shift to uttarakhand on the other hand ndma faced severe criticism that is national disaster management authority faced severe criticism after the uttarakhand flash floods in june 2013 for not coordinating disaster mitigation before the flash floods 
In Uttarakhand, the flash floods did not give time for coordination as the water level shot up to danger levels within 45 minutes. Speaking to the author on telephone by uh, Mr. Shashi the Reddy, at that time the chairman, vice chairman of the National Disaster Management Authority said, and I quote, IMD issues bulletins in standard pro forma, that is Indian Meteorological Department issues bulletins in standard pro forma and at 7.43 p.m. we had received a message that all was okay in the control room. The next contact with them was at 8.30 p.m. when it was reported that things were very bad. At 9 p.m. the cabinet secretary spoke to me to discuss. A response coordination is done by the Ministry of Home Affairs. Home Minister is also the chairman of the National Executive Committee of the National Disaster Management Authority. National Disaster Response Force was deployed next morning and by then everyone was stuck. Flood control measures like in dams were not taken up. The actions are to be initiated at state and district level. Unquote. Actions may have to be taken by state and district level officers, but the agency that is accountable, the desk where the buck stops, is National Disaster Management Authority. NDMA ought to monitor discharge, dam discharges in the weeks and months before the arrival of months. Mudslides and landslips had occurred and torrential flooding had washed away lands, stranding religious tourists on cliff caves and overhanging rock on the riverbed. The Central Water Commission has a flood forecasting unit which is the organization in charge of disaster mitigation in case of floods in India. Since the water in the river was below the statutory warning level of 539 meters at 23 hours on 17th of June no warning was issued unquote says Dr. V. D. Roy Director Flood Forecast Monitoring Directorate of Central Water Commission in New Delhi. He, tell, he told me this in an exclusive telephonic interview. The point of public interest being vested in government authorities was wholly missed because of non-application of discretion. If flood level is prescribed for 539 meters above mean sea level, surely the altitude in Himalayan terrain ought to have been factored in to issue flood forecast at a much lower level than 539 meters above mean sea level. It is a very expensive lesson learned at the cost of the death of thousands and thousands, indeed innumerable human mortality. Government of India, government officials in India are hardly accountable, even if, if it means death of thousands of innocent victims. Addressing a press conference on the 17th of June, State Chief Minister Vijay Bahuguna justified his government's inaction by claiming that the Quote, generic forecast delivered ahead of the floods was not actionable and evacuating residents and pilgrims in the peak pilgrim season was impracticable. Impractical, unquote. Incredible that elected representatives make such callous decisions indeed. The buck stopped at National Disaster Management Authority because it is mandated by legislation to coordinate measures for disaster mitigation. The National Disaster Management Authority should have monitored dam discharge, identified arterial routes for evacuation, stocked up on emergency supplies, created communication hubs, broadcast safety instructions, broadcast early warning at vulnerable spots, coordinated evacuation with state authorities and kept ambulances on standby in preparation for responding rapidly to forecasts. It is very, it is easy to criticize in hindsight, I agree. Uh, hence, it is quintessential to have a media that is trained in disaster reporting so that disaster preparedness can be audited on a weekly basis and when forecasts are, or early warning are issued, trained reporters on the field can audit preparedness minute by minute. But this this process of acting on early warning needs to be standardized as legislation and protocol demands. The purpose of documentation in public discourse is to share lessons learned with disaster managers in all vulnerable areas. The National Disaster Response Force was still in its infancy in terms of field experience. The terrain challenges humbled all rescue operations. District Magistrate Rudra Prayak requisitioned the local army formation and units in aid to civil authorities on the 17th of June 2013 evening. However, the advance parties, the eyes and ears of the formations and units of the armed forces were already getting pre deployed deployed beforehand based on preliminary information to conduct preliminary reconnaissance in affected areas and were beginning to shape enablement of larger forces to deploy and act later, says General Anil Chait, uh, PVSM, AVSM, VSM, ADC retired, former chief of integrated defense staff who led the central command to rescue the stranded and injured and recover the dead in the Uttarakhand crisis. In hindsight, it proves that accurate scientific forecast helps infinitely in uh, saving loss of lives. The Indian Meteorological Department's forecast of torrential rains in Uttarakhand, a copy of which was made available exclusively to me, states, quote, 
Indian Meteorological Department issued warning on the 15th of June 2013 to the state government about heavy to very heavy rains during the next 48 to 72 hours with possibility of landslides and very heavy rainfall, especially on the 17th of June and advised pilgrims not to proceed for Char Dham Yatra, a sacred pilgrimage for every Hindu consisting of Gangotri, Yamunotri, uh, Badrinath and Kedarnath. Incidentally, Gangotri is the birthplace of the river Ganges and Yamunotri is the birthplace of the river Yamuna, which Hindus hold very sacred and people who are already in the mountains to proceed to safer places. Isolated heavy rainfall during the next 24 hours in Dehradun, 22 centimeters, Purola, 17 centimeters, Dev Prayag, 13 centimeters, Uttarkashi 13 centimeters, and Teri 12 centimeters. Indian Meteorological Department informed Inspector General of Police in Intelligence about heavy to very heavy rain and landslides during the next 42 to 72, 48 to 72 hours, who in turn informed Chief Minister and Chief Secretary of the state respectively. Indian Meteorological Department informed Inspector General ITPP, the Indo-Tibetan Border Police, about heavy to very heavy rain and landslides during the next 48 to 72 hours on the 15th of June 2013. The inputs ought to have been coordinated by the National Disaster Management Authority instead of IMD informing the in uh, Indo-Tibetan border police about actionable inputs because National Disaster Management Authority is lawfully obliged to coordinate between agencies. So it was a collapse at the NDMA level. Indo-Tibetan border police is a paramilitary force used to not used to civilian command. Even in times of calamities, the service personnel deployed may be willing to sacrifice everything in service of humanity, but there is a command structure for deployment. It would have been the responsibility of the National Disaster Management Authority to coordinate the duties of separate agencies. This communication gap was also critical again, underscoring the critical significance of continuous and religious training and communication networks in disaster mitigation. The NDMA has to focus pre-disaster mitigation and leave it to the National Disaster Response Force to take up rescue and recovery, says Shashidhar Reddy. Today, science and technology has advanced so much that early warnings are based on accurate forecasts, be they hydrometeorological calamities like avalanches, blizzards, cloud bursts, coastal incursions, cyclones, droughts, desertification, epidemics, floods, flash floods, famine, forest fires, fog, hailstorms, landslides, mudslides, storm surge, storm squall, thunderstorms or hydrogeological calamities like El Nino, Southern Oscillation and Tsunami. Each of these calamities can have deleterious consequences on populations quite far away from the eye of the storm or the epicenter of an earthquake or the site of a volcanic eruption or whatever the nature of the calamity may be. For example, an avalanche may be triggered by the glacial melt caused by greenhouse gas emissions in cities far away from the avalanche prone mountainous areas. But an avalanche in the high Himalayas can cause flash floods downstream affecting vulnerable populations. Such are the linked chains of global theater of climate change and climate change induced disasters. There, I'm going to share a link over here uh, Dr. B. N. Goswami, director of the Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology in Pune, told IPS Interpress News Service in an article written by me, weather and climate can never be predicted perfectly. El Nino and La Nina are strongly related to occurrence of drought or floods over Indonesia and northern Australia and less strongly associated with droughts or floods over India and eastern Africa. The impact over Sri Lanka tends to be generally opposite to that over India. If floods devastate India, Sri Lanka will likely experience drought in the same period, but predicting this accurately is still impossible today. The vagaries of weather can have tumultuous effects on agriculture, trade, industrial production, tourism, fisheries, demography, and the economy. The impacts of El Nino during winter are warm conditions over South Asia and warm conditions over Southeast Asia and Southeast Africa and dry conditions over North Australia, said Dr. L.S. Rathford, Director General of the Indian Meteorological Department. Typhoons, cyclones and hurricanes are by and large the same thing, but nomenclatured differently in different parts of the world. The, their genesis is often in the open ocean where no populace is likely to be affected except perhaps ships, tankers and cruise liners. But ships, tankers and cruise liners are certainly fragile cargo in the oceans and if not guided to safety, they can be in the middle of an uncalled for disaster like oil spill or shipping accidents that put innocent lives in peril on far off coasts. Saving precious lives is the one universal aim of disaster managers everywhere. The tsunamis that were generated by the mega earthquakes in both Sumatra in Indonesia in December 2004 and the Sendai, Japan, uh, Tohoku, 
uh, earthquake in March 2011 did not cause much harm in the open ocean. However, there were some damage and mortalities. 20,352 people is the official death count in the Japanese tsunami by the United States Geological Survey. Three trains and a couple of ships could not be saved in the Japanese tsunami. Nonetheless, the effective dissemination of early warning in Japan saved thousands of lives, keeping the death toll low when compared to the annihilation wrought by the Asian tsunami. Without early warning, the Asian tsunami accounted for the death of 2,27,898 people, according to the USDS. In today's stage of scientific advances, a tsunami can be forecast pretty accurately, including the time of arrival of the tsunami, the expected wave height, and the course that it is likely to touch, as we have learned in this chapter. But science and technology today still lacks the ability to forecast the major trigger of a tsunami, submarine earthquake. Although determined efforts are being made to forecast earthquakes, including cognitive and incognitive approaches, neither the scientific community nor the policy makers are in any state of agreement regarding occurrence and forecast of earthquakes or even seismic events. Volcanoes can be forecast based on study of eruptions. In October 2011, I had delivered a radio talk in All India Radio Bangalore station on earthquake forecasting. I shall read you now. The script has been reproduced below for the benefit of the readers of preparing for the day after and I'm going to read it out to you now. Good evening. This is from the recording, the script of the recording. The Sikkim earthquake of September 18th, 2011 underscored the importance of earthquake prediction. But it remains one of the most challenging tasks for seismologists. Many attempts are being made ever since the Asian tsunami by the scientific community to predict earthquake. Earthquake prediction assumed critical significance and urgency after the Asian tsunami on 26th of December 2004, which caused the death of around 2,30,000 people in 14 countries around the Indian Ocean Rim. Never before had the scale of destruction been greater for humanity. The scale and magnitude of the natural calamity and its human disaster put enormous pressure on seismologists to predict earthquakes to prevent destruction of life. The challenge of earthquake prediction lies in predicting the location of the epicenter, the magnitude and the time of the earthquake and its consequences in far-flung places. Secondary calamities like aftershocks, volcanoes, tsunamis, landslides or landslips can cause destruction to life and property too. Nuclear disasters or thermal plants dysfunctioning can also add to the set of complementary disasters that follow the calamities as recent experience has shown. Breakout of epidemics, homeless people, weather-related disasters also belong to the realm of secondary disasters then. Landslides and landslips also trigger tsunamis. Rivers might change courses, flash floods may occur. While many theories are being propounded to predict earthquakes, some are considered rational, some only intuitive. For example, seismologists for example, seismologists try to predict the location of an earthquake's epicenter by studying the volcanic activities like the intensity of the rumbles and volcanic area. This school of thought belongs to the scientific realm of seismology. Then there is a prediction model based on marine mammal behavior. There are also a set of people who claim to be clairvoyant and predict earthquakes. Volcanology is considered a fairly accurate indicator of related seismic disturbances and release of seismic energy. Invariably, vol volcanic areas coincide with highly seismic zones, especially in the Pacific Ring of Fire. Volcanic eruptions release seismic energy which can one day hopefully be tabulated accurately, uh, accurately enough to predict earthquakes. Another theory correlates to beaching of marine mammals near continental shelves. The intensity of the quake is supposed to be directly proportional to the intensity of the cetacean stranding as well as likely intensity of an imminent earthquake. For example, late Professor Arunachalam Kumar, Dean of KS Hegde Medical Academy in Manipal, predicted in August 2010 that an earthquake is likely to occur between the 29th of August and 4th of September 2010 in the Sunda Plate. All of southeastern Asia, Indonesia and the New Zealand belong to the Sunda Plate. He based his prediction on the beaching of sperm whales off the coast of New Zealand on the 23rd of August 2010. Indeed, the Mount Merapi volcano in Indonesia erupted on the 29th of August before its classification as an extinct volcano and on the 4th of September 2010, an earthquake of magnitude 7.1 hit Christchurch in New Zealand. So now let us understand wildlife behavior before earthquakes and other geological events occur. Thereafter, we proceed to examine the dates of occurrence of earthquakes. That will help us understand the release of seismic energy in cyclical patterns. Here I put up a a link of an IPS article written by me. On this link, you will find uh, 
an article about wild animals' behavior before earthquake. At 14 degrees, a sperm whale beached in the port town of Karwar on India's west coast on the 15th of September 2009. Despite efforts to push it to the sea, it died the next day. Sure enough, on the 21st of September 2009, an M6.3 earthquake struck the Himalayan state of Bhutan on the border with India, Indian state of Assam, barely 2,000 kilometers from the point where the whale had beached. The location of the epicenter read as 28 degrees 14 44.82 degrees north latitude and 89 degrees 30 45.25 degrees east longitude not too far from a geological point of view in fact it happened on the same tectonic plate on which the indian subcontinent sit india's national center for biological sciences in bangalore documented animal behavior during the january 2010 total solar and uncode butterflies were not visible during the eclipse Urban wildlife activist Disha Barbe in Bangalore says, Squirrels refrain from foraging in the afternoons, nesting instead, and on new moon and full moon days, they are hardly visible. In 373 BC, historians recorded that animals, including rats, snakes, and weasels, deserted the Greek city of Hellas in droves just days before a quake devastated this place. This may be the first recorded instance of such reporting. Now let us study the pattern of seismic activity and dates of earthquake occurrence. Documentation will hopefully lead to a reliable model of earthquake prediction. Documentation by the United States Geological Survey indicates that the on and around the 26th of every month, a highly likely date day for occurrence of big earthquakes of magnitude 6 and more comes across. Let me read this out to you. 26th of December 1939, Turkey, M7.8. 26th of November 1942, Turkey, M7.1. 26th May 1957, Turkey, M7.1. 26th April 1959, Taiwan, M7.5. 26th January 2001, Bhuj earthquake in Gujarat, M7.6. 26th May 2003, Seven Trees, California, M3.8. Note that. Uh, 26th May 2003, Halmahera, Indonesia, M7. 26th May 2003, Muir Beach, California, M3.8 again. 26th December 2003, BAM earthquake, M6.6. 26th December 2004, Andaman, Sumatra, Mega earthquake, M9.1. 26th February 2005, Simulu, Indonesia, M6.8. 26th September 2005, Peru, M7.5. 26th May 2006, Java, Indonesia. Asia M6.3, 26th December 2006, Taiwan region M6.9, 26th December 2006, Taiwan region again M7.1, 26th July 2007, Moluka C M6.9, 26th September 2007, Papua New Guinea M6.8, 26th December 2007, Alaska earthquake M6.4, 26th April 2008, Nevada, M, Nevada USA M5, 27th February 2010, Bio Bio Chile M8.8, 26th October 2010, Mentawai earthquake M7.8 and so on. However, this does not mean that big earthquakes do not occur on other dates. They do. 26th of many a month is however a favorite indeed for release of massive seismic energy and seismic events. Is this a coincidence? The earthquakes on the 26th of a particular month located in the USA happen to be of a lower magnitude even though these locations belong to the specific ring of fire like the ones in Nevada and California. M3.8 I was talking about. The 11th of any month is also predisposed for release of seismic energy. Could there be a cyclical pattern to it? Could it be that lunar fraction of tidal energy affects release of seismic energy from the lithosphere? The 60 years geological cycle is being studied with seriousness after the Asian tsunami of December 2004. 63 years before that, a similar destructive tsunami following a mega earthquake had smashed Indonesia and in Andaman Nicobar Islands in 1941. And approximately 60 years before that, another great seismic event had occurred. The cataclysmic eruption of the Krakatau volcano in Indonesia led to violent tsunamis in the Indian and the Pacific Ocean and resulted in short-term climate change. And 50 years before the Krakatau supervolcanic eruption uh, that had triggered the tsunami in 1833, there was another mega earthquake which had triggered a massive tsunami according to numerous deaths, accounting for numerous deaths, according to the pages of Dr. George Pararas Karayanis, the link of which is put up here as well as in the description box below. 
Similarly, the Chile earthquake of 27th February 2010, that is the BioBio Bio earthquake, occurred exactly 60 years after the devastating M9.5 earthquake of May 22nd, 19. So, will the Alaskan mega earthquake of March 27, 1964, with a magnitude of 9.2, repeat its scale of destruction in 2024 in the same hemisphere? It doesn't hurt to be prepared, right? Another possible school of prediction can be based on geophysical pressure in seismic zones. In 1833, the epicenter of the mega earthquake was 2.5 degrees south 100.5 degrees east the epicenter of the 1861 earthquake was 1 degrees north 97.5 degrees east the epicenter of the 2004 mega earthquake was 3.316 degrees north 95.854 degrees east this shows that the rupture points for these mega thrust earthquakes have been pushing northward however the tsunami that was triggered by the super volcanic eruption of Krakatau was 6.102 degrees south or 105 degrees 105.423 somewhat south in a comparison to the seismic events that triggered tsunamis. A thorough study could help in accurately pinpointing the rupture points or, or epicenters. There is a need to measure the slant of sun rays synchronous to the calendar. That would possibly help us calibrate the tectonic thrust or the gradual shift of the polar angles. If seismologists or geophysicists could measure accurately the pressure building up in seismic faults, it could be another very reliable and scientific model of earthquake prediction. In fact, it would then fall into the realm of scientific prediction. What is the geophysical significance of slanted sun rays and slanted shadows on the day of vernal equinox, 21st March and 21st September? Logically, on the day of the uh, vernal equinox, the sun is on the Tropic of Cancer or the Tropic of Capricorn, as the case may be. So, areas where these latitudes run, the sun rays must be straight and not slanted. Similarly, the shadows of objects must not be slanted towards the north or the south. Can the degree of slant reveal building up of geophysical energy from the subterranean tectonic plate movements? Or could it mean a calibration of the shift in angles of poles? Geophysics has also not yet been able to accurately predict either rupture points or epicenters or the likely amount of release of thermal energy. Plate tectonics is a relatively new theory in the field of geology. Much of the Earth's seismic activities occur at the boundaries of these plates. It is a relatively slow movement driven by thermal convection currents and other geological activity originating deep within the Earth's mantle. Are mud volcanoes an indication of the rate of release of seismic energy as the eruption of the mud volcano in uh, Indonesia in May 2006 has revealed? An accidental eruption of the mud volcano was caused by prospectors of natural gas in Java, Indonesia. It has not stopped spewing mud and clay since May 2006 to date. A United States and the United Kingdom's geologists met at a conference in 2009 to try and assess its extinction. Their reassessment in August 2011 predicts now that it is likely to continue spewing mud and clay at least for another 25 to 30 years. Is this a slow inundation or sorry, is this slow inundation an indication of the potential of pyroclastic flow in the area? Has the eruption prevented a more violent volcanic eruption? Is the mud volcano intensely proportional? Is the mud volcano inversely proportional to pyroclastic magma? Many unanswered questions remain in the field of seismology. Is it possible to rupture artificially in the, en the energy building up in seismic faults? Can this always be benign like in the mud volcano in java indonesia how can we measure the energy release from volcanoes further the area near kalpakam in tamil nadu where a nuclear reactor is located is safe from the notoriously tsunami prone coast of tamil nadu what explains this it is indeed easier for man to take credit for flawless design of the hot water tanks in the nuclear reactor mankind is under great pressure to understand natural forces like earthquakes and other seismic events. The sooner we are able to understand these forces, the better we can predict, prevent destruction of life and property. These are the unanswered questions and cannot so easily be explained by rational science. We do have a long way to go before we understand Mother Nature's seismic patterns. Thank you for tuning in. That was the end of my radio talk. Oh. And that is all for tonight in tonight's reading of Preparing for the Day After. Tonight we have finished part 2 of chapter 19, Early Morning and Forecasting. Next week I will be able to com complete part 3 of the chapter 19, that is Early Morning and Forecasting. There is a little more to finish in this chapter on Early Morning. Uh, I hope to catch you during the live interaction on the 19th of February after the video at 7.30 p.m. Indian time. Until then, next week's video, take care, keep smiling, stay safe and stay home. Ciao.